started. Um, thanks everybody for coming. I'm Mike Losey, the Natural Resources Manager for the Township. And um, we're here today uh, with Drew from uh, um, Creating Sustainable Landscapes. Sorry about that, I had to double check that. <laughs> He's gonna do an awesome presentation about uh, native plants and doing uh, um, some wildlife planting in your own uh, yard and uh, around here at the township you can kind of see we've taken that to a larger scale at the Civic Center but uh, you can also um, scale that down to whatever approach you may need to take. Um, we want to thank the um, Friends of the Library for helping support the, um, uh, the talk here tonight um, and there's a prize drawing tonight that I would encourage everybody to enter to win. Uh, what's, what else in the bag tonight here? Oh, well, there's probably some awesome stuff in that bag if Kimberly put it together. And a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, um, the other thing I would encourage everybody to do if you haven't yet is uh, grab, a, um, grab a brochure and look at all the different events we have scheduled this year here at the Township uh, Grounds and at the, uh, at the Shiawassee Basin and things of that nature. Um, I think we're doing another tour on some private land. So if you're doing restoration of a natural community on your own property or you're doing some gardening, uh, you know, I'd encourage you to consider registering for that event as well. Um, and uh, I think that was about all the things I needed to mention before we get going. But uh, uh, welcome, Drew, and uh, looking forward to the talk. And uh, let's get started. Remember, you have to mute. What's that? You have to mute. Oh, that's right. I have to mute. That's right. <laughs> you should really wait till the end to make sure. Um, thanks, Mike. Um, I usually don't come this far to do a talk. You know, it's about a 45-minute drive for me, but I've long, long heard about what, what's been done here in Springfield Township and around the Civic Center. And um, it, it's, it's just really quite remarkable. Mike and I were talking about... I was acting like a four-year-old and just keep asking why. You, you know, it's like, well, what, 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 why did you do this? Well, because, you know, we thought it was a good idea. Well, why do you think it was a good idea? And, you know, just getting down to the leadership, you know, the leadership of the township, um, you know, at the foresight. And, you know, that just further ask, compels me to ask the question why. You know, what, what, what makes it different? And I don't necessarily, didn't necessarily expect an answer. Um, but, it, but it really is quite remarkable, the, the foresight and the vision to, be, um, to, to do this and, and create all this habitat around here. And if only more communities and, and, and agencies could, could do that, um, we could start to make a dent. Um, so I'm, I'm Drew Lathan. I have this small, niche native landscaping business. Um, we do mostly residential, but some commercial and some public spaces. And um, we work only with native species of plants. I, um, I think that'll become obvious to you as time moves on. I'm going to stand about here, and I'm not going to be able to see you. Okay. <laughs> you know, I see you going, I see you going like this. You know, I, I look for happy faces, and I look for frowny faces to give me some feedback. Um, so, so we only work with native plants, um, things like rain gardens and pollinator gardens and prairie gardens and, and, and the like. Um, some alternative lawn stuff like buffalo grass lawns, for example. And um, for people who may want to do the work themselves, we'll, we do, um, well, I do. I, I do some, some consultations with people, but most of our work is installation. Um, and, and if you want, there's a small information card in the back. Um, I think you have that. And so that's the end of my shameless commercialization. And um, I'll just sort of get into, into the presentation. I should click start so I keep track of my timer. Um, start, show of hands, who likes birds? Everybody likes birds, right? Did you raise your hand? See, I can't see you. Um, um, here's some, some numbers on bird population declines in the last 50 years. And, and this data is, is 10 years old, and I'm sure that it's, that it's um, oh, thank you, you moved over rather than, um, and I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure it's not any better. And, and I cherry picked some bird species there, but um, I only cherry picked based on what species of birds that I thought you'd recognize as opposed to um, some others, and, and the others are just as bad. And, and the reason is because of um, um, development in, in agriculture. And you just look at a picture 
of the U.S., a satellite picture, particularly east of the Mississippi, and you, you get a sense for just how much land we have gobbled up. Um, and, and on that land is a lot of lawn. Um, it's the largest cultivated crop in the United States, more than corn, more than soybeans. And um, it, it, we, it, you, you living out here, you can probably get a sense for just how much lawn is actually being created every day when you see a new development go up and you see a woodlands go down and you see lawn go in. You know, it's just sort of like, um, and um, we throw a lot of, lot of pesticides on those lawns, many, many of which are probable or possible carcinogens, um, a lot of gasoline, and um, 800, to the tune of 800 million gallons of gasoline a year in the U.S. to mow it, and at 20 pounds of carbon dioxide per gallon of gasoline, do the math. And we spill 25 million gallons of gasoline a year just filling our lawnmowers. Anybody who's filled a lawnmower knows, you know, you're trying to get the gas in it and it's going, you know, it overflows or you miss it and, and, and we all do that. And although not, maybe not much of an issue here, but more urban and suburbanized areas, we take all the water off the roof and off the streets and the parking lots into the storm sewer, into the river, then pull it out of the river, clean it to drinking water standards, and proceed to throw 30% of it on the ground. And if that makes sense to anybody, let's talk about that afterwards and, and help me with that. Um, in addition, a lot of our land is in agriculture, and you'll get no argument from me. We need to eat, um, and I like to eat at least as much as everybody else, and it's a good thing that my metabolism isn't that slow. Um, but we are converting our remaining grasslands to row crops at rates unseen in the last hundred years. And it's mostly a result of ethanol subsidies and crop insurance that incentivizes um, the, the conversion of our, our grasslands. A add to that the problem of invasive, invasive plants, plants that came here either by accident or for food or for ornamental reasons and um, are out, able to outcompete our native species. So there's a picture I took of a, um, up, in, up in the thumb of a healthy open woodlands that, that's actively managed. And this is the way our woodlands are, are supposed to look. You're supposed to be able to see through them and not be these dense uh, stands where you, you, you just, you, you have no idea what's on the other side. So there's a picture of a buckthorn thicket um, I believe this is a November picture, and you could see that nothing will grow underneath it. And, and the reason is it, it's still leafed out in November. And there's probably hun um, some honeysuckle in there as well, and that, that leaves out early, and buckthorn drops leaves late. And there's, there's honeysuckle on the left, and of course garlic mustard on the right. And these invasive species are able to outcompete our native species for light water space and nutrients. Um, garlic mustard is allelopathic, which means it puts a chemical into the soil that, um, it, it, that kills the fungi that attach to the roots of native plants that allow for the uptake of nutrients. So garlic mustard will, act will, will actively kill things as it marches forward. And then in every roadside ditch and wetland, uh, you have, you have fragmat Phragmites, that, that 15 foot tall uh, grass. And you look at that wetland that at one time probably had a great deal of diversity of plant species in there, and it no longer does, and, you prob and there probably um, are, are far fewer frogs and, and toads and, and other wildlife in there because uh, Phragmites won't, won't support the insect populations that they need. Um, in addition to that, big horticulture has introduced plants from other continents that come with diseases that our native plants don't have any defenses for. So Japanese chestnut came to the U.S. in the 1800s and all but wiped out the most abundant tree in the Appalachian chain, the American chestnut. Um, walk the Appalachian Trail and you won't see any chestnuts. And it used to be the most abundant tree in there. Um, you've probably heard of Dutch elm disease, of course. And then there's dogwood and thracnose. There is our native flowering dogwood, Cornus Florida. I have no idea how you could improve upon that. It, it's shockingly, it's a shockingly beautiful plant. 
but big horticulture has seemed fit to bring kusa dogwood, kusa, uh, cornus kusa here, that sometimes comes with dogwood and thracnose, it's a fungus, that our native flowering dogwoods don't have any defenses for. So they reap the, they reap the, the benefits of the profits, but pay for none of the externalities um, that, that they cause. And then sudden oak disease um, came in on foreign nursery stock. It's a fungus also. And if it gets in the wound of an oak tree, particularly a red oak, um, it can kill that tree in two weeks and then spread via roots to adjacent oak trees as well. And, and it's here in Michigan. Uh, so um, if you have an oak, M Michigan State MSU Extension says no pruning of it between, say, the middle of April to the middle of August. Um, some of those dates vary. Um, but there's also some data that says, although you're, you're mostly safe in that, that, that if you want a 0% chance of your your oak uh, contracting um, this disease. The only good time of year to prune it is December, January, and February. You know you'll be 100% safe if you prune your oak during those times. So the bottom line is that between 95 and 97% of the original U.S. land mass has been cut, plowed, or paved. 95 to 97%. So even here, with all the restoration of, of native species, you look out there, almost nothing is original. Um, the, 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 the most common original thing you, you'll find generally is that oak tree that's, that's like this, um, that, that somebody had a heart and, and didn't cut down. But most of it, you know, most of this has been either logged or, or row cropped. And so um, as a result, the carrying capacity of the land has declined, and biodiversity has suffered as a result, as evidenced by the, the crash in bird populations and the fact that you don't see <coughs> many other animal and plant species that used to inhabit this area. So paleontologists talk about the sixth, ex the sixth extinction that um, we're starting to talk about we're going through now and, and the rates of extinction unseen um, in, in, in a long period of time, and having moved from the Holocene to the Anthropocene, and the Anthropocene defined as a, uh, the era in the planet that is human-dominated, um, primarily human-dominated. And when you stop to think about it, we've changed the chemistry of the air, we've changed the chemistry of the water, and we have so altered the land. And, um, I mean, look at Pacific plastic, um, you, you know, all the plastic and garbage. And I've just been reading recently that that stuff is now migrating into the Arctic. A um, number of years ago, I saw this movie. It was, um, it was at the, the Banff Film, Film Festival that, that aired in Ann Arbor a couple of years ago, where these two guys went above the Arctic Circle in Norway and lived there through the winter and made their shelter out of just all the garbage that washed up on, on the shore. So um, that's the bad news. So let's shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about what birds eat in the spring. And primarily they're eating insects right now. You know, there's a lot of leaves out there and um, they're not eating seeds for the most part, although you'll see birds poking around on the ground to try to find some, some of the last seeds. But the seeds are largely gone, they're germinating. And, and not to be found. Um, they're not eating berries. Um, they've even fallen off the crab apple trees at this point in time. Um, so 96% 90, of terrestrial bird species are feeding their young insects in the spring, particularly Lepidoptera, the, the caterpillars of moths and butterflies, 96%. So that chickadee there will only go 50 yards to get caterpillars to feed its young, 50 yards only. And in those 50 yards, it needs between 350 and 570 caterpillars each and every day. Now, not necessarily those big honking caterpillars, because some of them are quite small, um, but that's still a lot of caterpillars. And over the 16 days that it's raising its clutch, it needs between six and 9,000 caterpillars. That's a lot of caterpillars to feed just one chickadee nest. And it has to be within 50 yards. So now think, two chickadee nests, a robin's nest, a cardinal nest, a wren, 
and all the other bird species. And the number of caterpillars that are necessary to support bird populations is, it, it, it's just, it just goes up exponentially. Um, and there's, there's a lot of protein in, in, those, in, in those caterpillars. Um, so amphibians eat a lot of insects, fish eat insects, and even 23% of the diet of black bears are insects. And these are big animals. So when you start to think about how many insects that might be that a black bear eats, that's, that's, that's a lot. So a lot of things eat insects um, and are critically dependent on, on robust insect populations. And, and so insects are very important. In fact, 75% of all animal species worldwide are insects. Um, weighed, they, they make up more weight than all other animal species combined on the planet. And half of those insects are herbivorous insects. So 37% of all animal species worldwide are insects that eat plants. So that's a lot of insects out there chomping on plants. So plants have evolved defense mechanisms to protect themselves. Things like thorns, um, mostly, mostly helpful to keep deer and children out. Um, but there are also lignans and grasses um, and chemicals in them um, that are, are in many cases toxic. So, you know, that white sap that comes out of a milkweed is, is actually toxic. And, and chemicals are the most common defense for, for, for plants, um, bitter tastes. So how many people here, for example, would grab an onion and just bite into it. There's usually one in the crowd. Um, but God did not put an onion on this planet for us to cut up and put in frying pans. That taste of the onion and what it does to your sinuses and your eyes is a chemical defense that it has evolved to keep people and things from eating it. Same thing for mints. Now, humans have acquired a taste for mints, but most things have not. And so as things start to leaf out, if you went around and picked leaves and started to chew on them, you're going to find they, they all don't taste like lettuce. They, they taste pretty bad. And, and so that, that, that taste keeps insects also from eating them. And, and many of those bitter tastes are actually, actually toxic. So let's talk about monarchs for a little bit, because monarchs have been in the news quite a bit in terms of their, their population crashes, and in fact, um, yesterday on NPR in the Environment Report, there was a little thing about monarchs. And the monarchs have, um, I, I think monarch sightings um, websites have shown that they, they have now crossed into Michigan. Um, and, and monarchs have this special relationship with milkweeds, although, although um, monarch butterflies can take nectar from many species of flowers, it's the leaves that, that feed the young. And the caterpillars can only eat milkweeds, and, and they chomp on those leaves. So there is the, uh, sap, the sap coming out. It's a cardiac glycoside. Um, so a little insect that may bite into a milkweed um, could, will, will very quickly expire. Now, if you could get beyond the taste of a milkweed and eat enough of it, um, it would eventually stop your heart, too. Um, but that, that would take some doing. Um, now, if the, the, the toxin doesn't get it, the sap will, because it's very thick and gooey. And so an insect may bite into it and then just drown or, or suffocate in that, in that sap. And so the, the loss of milkweed is the prime reason for, for monarch decline. Um, because, because without milkweeds, there are no monarchs. And it coincides with the introduction of Roundup-resistant, genetically modified crops. Whereas in the past, farmers would till their fields to control weeds, um, um, milkweeds would tolerate and, and survive tilling. And, and so they'd support monarchs, monarchs. But now farmers can spray their field with Roundup, and, and milkweed will not survive Roundup. So about 20 years ago, when we started spraying our agricultural fields with Roundup, 
we saw the loss of milkweed and concurrently with that the loss of monarchs. So when you look at this monarch caterpillar eating that milkweed leaf, what do you not see? You don't see the sap. So what this, what they do is they walk out to the petiole here and they'll snip the vessel that supplies the, the sap to the leaf and then it can go walk down to the bottom of the leaf and munch away on it. So the toxin, it, it, it's adapted to the toxin and the toxin won't kill it, but it might gum up the works. And so this is a behavioral adaptation that monarchs have evolved over millennia to be able to eat, eat milkweeds. And like the monarch, 90% of insects are specialists and eat a very, very narrow range of plants. In fact, the federally endangered Carner blue butterfly will only eat eastern lupine, uh, Lupinus perennis. It won't even eat other lupines, whereas the monarch will eat all seven of the milkweeds native to our region and probably and, and any of the 40 or 50 species of milkweeds native from here all the way down into the, the southwest. Hummingbird moths, their favorite hosts, host plants are uh, American viburnums, not European viburnums, not Asian viburnums, but only American viburnums. So while adult insects may take nectar from many species of flowers, it's usually the leaves that feed the young. So butterfly bush, sold by big horticulture as supposedly a great plant for butterflies, is a functionally useless plant because it is from China and it has chemical defenses that allow exactly zero species of insects and caterpillars to eat. So it begs the question, why feed the, feed the adults when you're starving the kids? So imagine this. You sit down at the dinner table with your kids or your grandkids and you pull up the dinner platter first and you shovel some food onto your plate and you turn to the kids and you say, sorry, you can't eat. And that's butterfly bush. So, um, and so not only is it functionally useless, it is also now appearing on invasive species lists. So um, it's supposed to rain tomorrow, it's supposed to rain Saturday, but Sunday it's supposed to be nice. So on Sunday, go home and rip out your butterfly bushes. One of my favorite, least favorite plants. Um, is, that, is that different from the butterfly bee? Yes, different. So butterfly bush is in the genus Bodleia, and butterfly weed is Asclepius, which is a milkweed. Absolutely, yep, very different. And that's always the problem with common names, is w w what are they actually referring to? So insects can eat specific plant species when they've evolved certain behavioral, uh, certain adaptive mechanisms. The first is the, the ability to find their host plant. If, you, if you've ever watched a female monarch looking to lay her eggs, she will just keep flying around and flying and flitting around until she sees a milkweed and bam, land right on it. She has very good plant ID skills. Uh, the second is the ability to synchronize their life cycle with needed parts of the plant. So monarchs are now just coming into Michigan and the milkweeds are just starting to emerge from the ground and they're timed pretty well. What climate change is gonna do to that timing, we don't know, um, but, but you see those kinds of relationships. The third is physical and behavioral adaptations to be able to eat their host plant. An example would be the, the monarch caterpillar snipping the petiole so that it can eat the milkweed leaf, and then the digestive enzymes to detoxify and get rid of those chemicals out of its system so that, that they're not poisoned. Now interestingly, as a side note, the, the monarch retains that toxin, and that serves as its defense mechanism against birds eating it so that it tastes bad and is poisonous. And then the, the, the queen and the viceroy butterflies have evolved to look like monarchs to trick birds into thinking that they're monarchs and, and taste bad as well. And these evolutionary processes take thousands of years to occur. Evolution is a very slow process for just about everything except bacteria. And so what that means is um, insects, as a general rule, can only eat native plants. Those 90% of insects that are specialists um, can only eat their host native plant. 
So um, what's a native plant? There are a number of definitions around, but a good operational definition of a native plant is a plant that was here before European settlement. And we have pretty good records on what those plants are. <coughs> it would exclude naturalized aliens, <coughs> um, plants that are well adapted to our climate and soils. Queen Anne's lace is an example of that, very well adapted here, but not a native plant. And it excludes plants from other ecoregions of the US. Colorado blue spruce would be an example of that. The word Colorado should be the first tip off. So non-native plants don't support wildlife, and they don't because our native insects have not had enough evolutionary time to overcome the chemical defenses that are present in non-native plant tissues. So there's a picture of butterfly weed again. No argument for me, it's a beautiful plant. Just, it's just a dangerous plant. Um, and so it would take thousands of years uh, for insects to evolve to be able to eat that plant. So our native plants are far better hosts for our native insect species. Goldenrods, for example, will support 112 species of Lepidoptera. Um, I believe there are 14 species of goldenrods native to our region. Is that correct? I'm, I'm, in, the, I'm in the ballpark, 14 yes. species of goldenrods. I'm in the ballpark, some of which are woodland species. So I'm not just talking about this old field Canada weedy goldenrod. Um, there, there are some that are, that are not weedy as all, at all. Asters will support 105. Joe Pye's more than three dozen, and oaks are the winner at more than 500 species of Lepidoptera that they will support. So when we don't have native plants in our landscapes, we don't have insects. Here are the usual suspects in our yards and very, very, very little support for insects. So um, the forsythia are done blooming. They support one species of insect. And in fact, if you'd gone and looked at the flowers, when they were in bloom, you don't even see bees in them. Um, boxwoods, one species of insect. Now, boxwoods are a particularly stupid plant because if you've ever seen a boxwood on a west or north side of a building on a cold winter and then look at it in the spring, it is not adapted to our climate. And the only way you can make it adapted to our climate is wrap it in burlap. Now, how much sense does that make? Why not use a plant that's adapted to our climate? Um, compare that to the number of um, insect species supported by our native plants, and there's no contest there in terms of how many they support. So you look at that oak leaf, those oak leaves there, and you might gasp. I mean, you stand back from, from an oak in, in the summer, and you know, it looks all green and lush, but you walk up, and that's what it's going to look like. Um, but that's cause for celebration because it's showing that that oak is supporting a lot of insects. There are a lot of things munching on it and hence supporting birds. So the bottom line is that native plants produce four times the insect biomass, three times the insect species, 13 times the caterpillar species, and 35 times the caterpillar biomass. That's 3,500% more caterpillar biomass that is supported or, or, or fed by, produced by native plants than non-native plants. So the food chain starts with plants. Uh, the only thing that can convert the, the energy of the sun into biomass. When they're native, they support insect species. Remember, 90% of our insects are specialists and can only eat native plants then support 96% of the terrestrial bird species that are feeding their young insects, as well as amphibians, and then also the things that eat the things that eat the insects. So a great blue heron may not eat insects directly, but it is critically dependent on things that do require insects. So that great blue heron needs insects as well. Well, bees are picky eaters too. In fact, our indigenous bees are four times more likely to take nectar from native flowers than non-native flowers. It only makes sense, they co-evolved. And in fact, 20% of our bees, and I think there are 400 species of bees native to Michigan, so 20% of that would be 80, 80 species of bees. 
are what's called monoelectric or oligoelectric, which means they will take nectar from only a very narrow range of plants because they co-evolved with them. Shape of the flower, shape of the proboscis kind of works together. So the sunflower bee um, will only take nectar from our native sunflowers, which are in the genus Helianthus. And Helianthus does not bloom until August. So this bee lays dormant in the ground until August. Helianthus blooms. It emerges from the ground, has a party like you've never seen. And then when Helianthus is done blooming, these bees will go lay eggs in the ground and die. And those eggs will lay dormant until the following August when they'll hatch and come out. Now, no Helianthus means no sunflower bees. Um, in addition, our native plants are able to tolerate the sub-zero temperatures we get in the winter and the inevitable heat and drought that we get in the summer. And they can do that without ever needing to be watered, fertilized, or sprayed. Because <coughs> who watered, fertilized, or sprayed them in pre-settlement times? And they can do that because of their deep root systems. So there is turf grass and it's four inch deep root system. So some of these species of native plants have root systems that go as deep as 15 feet. There is Liatris cylindracea, a plant that's only 12 to 15 to maybe 18 inches tall, lives in pure sand, but it has a 15 foot deep root system. So when it's hot and dry out, these plants don't even know it's dry because they're sucking on water from deep within the ground. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about this later. Here's buffalo grass, native to the high plains to about as far east as Chicago. Only grows about five inches tall. Um, but it has an eight foot deep root system and can be in the right, in, in, in certain situations, a good turf grass substitute. But we'll talk about that in a little bit. So with a little bit of photoshopping, here is Indian grass and its root system. This would be ground level right about there. So there is more biomass below the ground than there is above the ground. There's switchgrass, Missouri goldenrod, compass plant, very deep root systems. And, and this is why they don't need to be fertilized because with root systems like that, they can get all the nutrients they want. In fact, if you start to fertilize these plants, they're gonna get taller than, than they're supposed to be and then will just flop. And, and many of them will actually croak because imagine if I sat you down at this table and, and kept giving you food and told you, no, you can't stop eating. You just gotta keep eating and eating and eating. I mean, how long would you live doing that? So the advantages of using native plants in, in your landscape is increased habitat. And then a byproduct of that is the joy of seeing all this habitat and, and all this wildlife that you attract. And I'm gonna show you pictures um, from the last two places I've lived uh, showing you all the wildlife that I've attracted. You can reduce or eliminate input, resource inputs like water and fertilizer and chemicals, um, which results in lower water and sewer bills, um, lower chemical bills, and of course without chemicals it's a healthier, safer place for wildlife, you, your kids, your pets, your grandkids um, to, to live in. So for just about any non-native plant you give me, just about all, I can give you a native substitute that is structurally the same. Um, instead of typical grass, I can give you buffalo grass. Instead of perennial fountain grass, I can give you prairie drop seed or a little blue stem or side oats grama um, that, that's structurally the same. Instead of daylilies, you know those yellow Stelladoro daylilies you see in the summer? There's so many of them I find it nauseating. Um, I can give you any number of perennials that would be uh, structurally the same. Black-eyed Susan flowers later in the season, uh, but it flowers for way longer. And then instead of Japanese spirea, which is also now showing up on invasive species lists, I can give you common nine bark uh, or red twig dogwood or any no number of shrubs that uh, are structurally the same. So. Um, so big horticulture will only talk about the beauty of their plants and, and they do have beautiful plants and they darn well better be
because they spend a lot of money and time on breeding programs. Um, but they won't talk about function. And they won't because they can't. Because for the most part, they are selling plants from other continents that don't support wildlife. So instead of using the brand Proven Winners, which I refer to as Proven Losers, um, go get plants that are Proven Dinners. So question, would you landscape like this in the Southwest? Phoenix Landscaping, I shit you not. Um, the answer is no, because without a lot of water, this is what it's going to look like. Um, in the middle of the summer, we need about an inch of water a week for our lawns, and that's a lot of water. And our average temperature is 64 and 84 here. And we get 34 inches of rain a year. In Phoenix, um, they get seven inches of rain a year, and their July average temperature is 84 and 107. So a landscape like this probably needs an inch of water a day, and they certainly don't have the water. Instead, you would landscape like this in the desert southwest. And the plants in the desert southwest have evolved not deep root systems, with rare exceptions like the mesquite. They've mostly evolved wide lateral root systems. And why those kind of root systems? Because they can get a lot of water from five one hundredths of an inch of rain when they have these wide, shallow root systems. So if you wouldn't landscape like this in the southwest, it begs the question why you'd landscape like this here. Now, this may not be a typical house, but this is how it's typically landscaped. You recognize those plants? They're, they're in all landscapes. You know, there's Bradford pear, which is an insidious, invasive species. Um, but but dim-witted landscapers still see fit to plant them. So to an insect, this is a desert. There is nothing to eat there. I mean, except those 10%, like aphids. So there, there's, there's really no support for insects there. In addition, you go out into the wild and you see these different layers. You see the canopy layer, the shrub layer, the herbaceous layer, the ground layer. Um, but you look in those developments and you don't see that. Um, you see all the pieces. There, there are trees there and there are shrubs and there are perennial beds, um, but they're disconnected. The difference is, this is the puzzle put together. This is the puzzle sitting on the table with all the pieces just scattered. And so it's very difficult for wildlife to move across those, those different layers. So one day I'm driving around and I go, oh look, wild oak meadows. It's on wild oak lane, there's a big burr oak in front, and I go in and it is neither. Um, there is the intersection of Acorn Trail and Overlook Trail. It's in Novi, where I live. Anybody ever been to Novi? It's your quintessential sterile solace suburb. Um, but the, at this intersection, there is not one tree that produces an acorn, and the Overlook is into a mowed detention basin. Really? Look at all these new developments that are being built. They are all named after what they destroyed. So I think these developers are um, employing the services of George Orwell Associates to come up with names for these new subdivisions that are being built. So we have landscapes without nature. We've been taught by big horticulture that the only good insect is a dead insect. Um, we're taught to select plants that are pest free, which is code for plants from other continents with chemical defenses that prevent everything from eating them. Um, but when we do find an insect, what are we taught to do? Kill it. It's the exact opposite of what we should be doing. So we live in landscapes with few insects. Well, so what? Well, when you landscape like this, you end up with fragmented landscapes. Look at this agricultural area. It was probably forest at one point, but see how far apart those woodlots are. There's where I live in Novi, and there's still some natural areas that the mayor hasn't seen fit to allow developers to cut down and, and convert to housing, but they're highly fragmented. So there's this age-old question. Why did the turtle cross the road? 
The turtle crossed the road because the wetland on one side of the road is not large enough for it. It needs the wetland on the other side of the road as well. So it makes a mad dash across the road. Sometimes it makes it and sometimes it doesn't. Actually, it used to be just one wetland, but we decided to pave a road right down the middle of it. So that's all the bad news. So here's the way out. Um, and, and we're really starting to talk about a new paradigm and a new way of thinking about our landscaping. And it starts with the understanding that um, nature no longer um, exists apart from us, that it's just something out there and we could do whatever we want at home. Because the crashes in, and, and extinction that's going on demonstrates that nature out there is no longer large enough to support biodiversity. And so the front lines for the battle in, in nature are, of course we should be conserving our natural areas, but we're talking about bringing nature home and, and introducing it in our front yards, in our backyards, around our libraries and civic centers, as has been done here, outside our corporate offices um, and, and, and around our schools. And, and so we're, we're looking to reconstruct nature in and around us. So we all become the ecological warriors of the future. Um, and you can do it now without joining the Sierra Club or the Natural Resources Defense Council, all groups with certain um, political bents which may or may not coincide with yours and and you can do that apolitically now so this so this new ways thinking about bringing nature in in and amongst us so that our plantings are no longer just beautiful but do the double duty of cleaning our stormwater and providing as a um, reservoir for genetic diversity so we can do that by starting to build habitat corridors in our cities and our suburbs. So there we are, we can start to build more and more corridors. So if I live next to a woodlot and landscape with native plants, and you live next to me and landscape with natives, and you live landscape next to her and um, landscape with natives, and you live next to a woodlot, we've now provided a wildlife corridor where wildlife can stop along the way um, raise young, eat, and find shelter without having to jump over a chemically laden suburban uh, yard, yard or yards. We're, we're also talking about building plant communities. Um, one, the inherent advantage of native plants in supporting uh, wildlife, um, but we're also choosing plants that evolved in our landscapes that um, evolved in circumstances similar to what we have. So if you have sandy soils in the full sun, you're going to use plants that evolved in a sand prairie. If you have shade and clay and wet, you're going to use plants that evolved in shady, wet, clay areas. Um, we're also talking about combinations of plants and putting them together um, it, such that these combinations evolve together out in the wild so that we know these plants play well together amongst themselves. So when you look at this plant community here, um, I took this picture at the Kresge Foundation in Troy, where they landscape um, almost exclusively with native plants. You see um, um, plants picked there that bloom across the whole growing season. So you're providing um, nectar and pollen resources for plants or, or for insects and bees and butterflies across the whole growing season. You can also see different textures. Um, we also, in building communities, don't plant the, the way we've been taught to plant, of plant, mulch, plant, mulch. I mean, you could look at some plantings and it's 10% plant material. We landscape almost as if we hate plants. Here we're talking about packing them in tight. And what that does is it helps insects find their host plant and with a large drift. So here's a large drift of Baptisia, for example. Well, it'd be easy for something that uses that as a host plant to find that plant, as opposed to if there was just one there. Um, and so we have something that is functional and beautiful at the same time. And we can make our landscapes beautiful using native plants and formal looking 
like this. And you could see here, they, they mirrored the Baptizi and the little blue stem and the penstemon and the switchgrass, and they mirrored it on the other side as well. Very formal, very beautiful, very functional. So here's where I start to um, make uh, master gardeners and horticulturalists uncomfortable because I break a lot of the rules, because the rules don't make sense. Um, one is, when you're landscaping, accept the environmental conditions of the site. Um, a lot of times, you know, people have really crappy soil, really sandy soil, and the advice of landscapers is usually, oh, we need to amend that soil and bring more nutrients into it. Nonsense. It's a lot of effort, a lot of money. Um, you use plants that evolved in those exact circumstances that you have. Um, um, most landscapers will put in gallon containers of plants. Well, these little plugs that are two inches around and five inches deep will establish quicker because that gallon container has been babied its whole life and when put in the ground is not going to feel compelled to put its roots out. But that little plug when put in the ground is going to feel like it got a get out of jail free card and it's going to put its roots out quicker and it will not require water sooner than that gallon container plant. And then you'd be shocked. You're, you're going to think that they're giving these plugs away for free when you compare the price of that. Um, so you look at this picture. I took a butterfly weed, and you can see it's a small plant because of the, the black, the, of the swallowtail on it. Um, but look how crappy that soil is. Um, but I can give you 30 species of plants that will thrive and be beautiful in that soil. So, um, butterfly, butterfly weed, eastern lupine, little blue stem. Um, there are even two species of prickly pear cactus that are native to Michigan that you can put in there. Now this plant, while thriving there, wouldn't stand a chance here and vice versa. <clears throat> so when you have a wet area, you use wetland plants and we have, for some of our clients, um, it, it planted into standing water, uh, some plants. So, um, so there's a picture of my backyard. One of the principles, uh, as I alluded to earlier, is plant the ground densely. Um, so there are a couple things going on here. One is I have the layers going on. This used to be all turf. Um, here's, here's a river birch as the um, canopy layer. And there's a canopy also here in my neighbor's property. But here's the shrub layer, a uh, red twig dogwood there and there. And here's some Rudbeckia fulgida, nice big drift of it, and some cardinal flower and blue lobelia and brown fox sedge. And as a ground cover, I use wild strawberry, which will work its way in and amongst the plants and not outcompete them. So th I have those layers. It's densely planted. And I spend about four minutes a year weeding this bed because of the dense planting in there. So for those of you who are lazy like I am, as, as gardeners, plant dense. Um, additionally, in, in addition, um, there's a storm sewer over here. The ground slopes this way and the ground slopes this way and that's, that's the model, get rid of the water, treat storm water as a waste. Well, I started this area by building a rain garden here and a rain garden over there, and I took that soil and I built a berm around the storm sewer to keep the water out of it, to capture that water in there. And then I built a pond over here. And then I started thinking, you know, my sump pump, which runs every 15 minutes, runs underground into the storm sewer. How about if I put a diverter on it and run a pipe into the pond? So now that sump pump goes into the pond it overflows from the pond into here, and it's no longer a rain garden. It is now a swamp. But I have wetland plants in there, and these plants look very, very happy, don't they? Because I'm matching the plant to the site um, that, that I have. So that, that's a design and, and installation principle. Now, maintenance principles. Um, one is we're, we're taught to clean and tidy up in the fall, right? and put your beds to, to rest. Nonsense. Um, leave your leaves in your beds 
or, and if you can, rake them, but rake them gently off your lawn into your beds. Now, I'm not going to embarrass anybody here by asking you to show hands, but how many people rake your leaves in the fall and get rid of them and turn around and buy mulch in the spring? You got free mulch here. In addition to that, a lot of things will overwinter in this leaf litter. There are some species of butterflies that will overwinter as eggs, some as caterpillars, and even some as adults. So you rake those leaves away and get rid of them, and you're throwing, around, throwing away all potentially uh, butterflies. Um, another maintenance principle, don't cut your plants down in the fall. Um, because one, the seeds will provide for birds. That you know, I don't cut my stuff down, that's my bird feeder. In, in the winter. Also, many of the stems of plants are hollow, and that serves as places for insects to overwinter and, and get shelter. Cut them down to the ground and get rid of that. The insects have no place to go in, in the winter. And then, of course, things can hide in, in all that stubble. Now, in the spring, when you do cut, cut it down, I advocate only cutting down to about knee height. And the reason for that is, again, in those stems that are hollow, Bees will come lay eggs. So there's your bee house. And then the other plants will grow up around it pretty quickly. So there's swamp milkweed. You can see the hollow stem there. Um, place for bugs in the winter and bees to lay eggs in the spring. Um, there's one of my front beds. And that's what, when I don't burn it, uh, that's about as, as, um, I, as, as low as I cut it. Um, there's evidence of goldfinches eating my echinacea seeds. And there's um, one of my front yard rain gardens. Um, doesn't look like it does in the summer, obviously, but in, in, in my mind, in my aesthetic at least, it, it looks better than just bare snow. And, and I got places for things, things to live. Another principle is when you do cut things down, just, just drop it and mulch it in place. Again, you have free mulch there. And you, you may look at that and go, oh, that's pretty ugly. But in a few weeks, that's what it looks like. Um, with my wild geranium and my columbine there. Um, another one is allow for self-healing. When you leave seeds up, you know, plants die. And leaves a hole, and then what do you, what do, you do? You go to the nursery and you buy another one. Well, there was uh, a um, columbine that died. Well, there's a new columbine seedling coming up to fill that place. So I now don't have to go, into my, go in my car, spew carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, spend my scarce money. Um, there's a free plant. Um, another maintenance principle is you can use prescribed burning. So I did this burn Five weeks ago, I think, was um, most, most of Michigan burned in pre-settlement times. Uh, every five to ten years, fire was very common. And so our plants have evolved for fire. That's my buffalo grass lawn. Um, that's one of my rain gardens burning. So fire returns nutrients to the soil. It kills invasive species. It um, blackens the soil, allows solar radiation to hit it sooner warms the soil, that's my perennial bed burning, it warms the soil quicker and gives your native plants a head start, probably to the tune of about two weeks. They'll start coming back two weeks. That's, one of my, that's my prairie drop seed bed burning. Um, know what you're doing, have a permit. It's one of my backyard rain gardens burning. It was 42 degrees that day, humidity was about 30 percent, and the wind was out of the southeast at 10 to 15 miles an hour. There's my other rain garden burning. And you can see that turf grass doesn't burn. It's too green and wet to burn. It's a natural fire break. That's what the buffalo grass looked like after, burnt, after it was burned in the perennial bed, in the rain garden. 
rain garden, prairie drop seed bed, a bed of little blue stem. You could see even the stuff that had started to green up and come up unaffected by the fire. There too. So, um, of course, never any pesticides because we are purposely trying to grow insect food. Um, no watering, fertilizing, and um, you could start with some mulch, but with a dense planting, um, it's going to be exclusionary to weeds and, and you won't need to mulch again. So let's talk about buffalo grass a little bit. That was my front, that was my front yard at my house when I lived in Ann Arbor. Um, Buffalo grass native from the High Plains to about as far east as Chicago, only grows five inches tall. That is it, unmowed, eight, inch, eight foot deep root system as opposed to four inches with typical turf. Um, no water, no fertilizer, and in the middle of the summer when it's hot and dry, that's what it looks like. When everybody else is, is trying to no avail to keep their lawns green by, um, by watering. Now, buffalo grass requires full, full, full sun, um, and it can grow on anywhere from a sandy loam to a loamy clay soil. Now, I've gotten a patch to grow on hard, compacted clay, but it took three years. You know that patch of buffalo grass I showed you burning? It, it's pretty thick, but it took three, it took three years for it to, um, to grow. Now, um, but it's a warm season grass. Sorry? I, yeah. Sorry, I yeah, it's a warm, se fun. it's a warm season grass. I think it's C4. Um, now, the downside of buffalo grass is that's what it looks like in the winter from about the 1st of November to almost the 1st of May. But if you can put up with not watering, not fertilizing, and not mowing, then maybe you can put up with that in, in the winter. Now, if you can't use buffalo grass because you have too much shade or you have the wrong soil type, um, convert to putting beds in and just having narrow pathways of grass. So you saw that, There's, that's my buffalo grass lawn patch. Um, that's a rain garden, that's a perennial bed, rain garden, perennial bed, that's the grass bed. So you saw all those burn. Um, but put in narrow pathways. And so, I mean, I have a little bit of lawn left. I mean, this is, this is traditional turf. Um, by the way, I maintain it organically. You cannot tell the difference between that and my neighbor's turf. Um, but there's a pathway there and a pathway there. And there's a pathway in early August, and you saw that vantage point of that rain garden, but you could see the, the pathway. So we use native plants um, because plants, again, they, they convert plants, the only thing that convert the energy of the sun into biomass. Um, when they're native, they support insects, support birds, amphibians, and up the food chain. And at home, when we don't have native plants, we don't have insects, nor birds and amphibians, and up the food chain. So I'm going to show you some examples. Based on the model of prairie um, as an archetype, um, we've all seen this guy, right? Maybe somebody here is this guy. But it begs the question, why do this when you can have this, or this, or this, or this, or that? out there. Uh, that's the back 40 of the Kresge Foundation. But you could do it in small spaces too. That was my backyard in Ann Arbor. And my house was on 14 hundredths of an acre. Do you know how small 14 hundredths of an acre is? Um, and that's just the backyard. So you could have a prairie garden in a small spot. We can also use um, pr short prairie grasses. That was my lawn extension in Ann Arbor. Um, just five species of short prairie grasses. Client liked it so much, he said, do that for me as well. There is a prairie drop seed that's in Indian Springs Metro Park out in front of their center, not too far away from here. 
same grass on the side of my house. Very, it is, it is the most fragrant native plant I know. Um, when the wind is blowing in this direction toward the house, I can smell it when it's in flower on the other side of my house. You can smell it 100 feet away. Um, prairie drop seed, this is at the Kresge Foundation. Um, um, river oats over there. Little blue stem's a great little grass. Um, you can see the name of it, how it gets its name, it's bluish. And it has these beautiful white seed heads on it that persist. This is the same plant that persisted into winter. And it held on to its seeds until that first windstorm that, that, that crashed the, the, the Michigan basketball team plane. Um, there's buffalo grass. In that particular instance, I mowed it. Um, and you only need to mow it once a month because it doesn't grow tall fast enough to require any more frequent mowing. And then rain gardens. Um, all a rain garden is is just a depressed perennial bed um, instead of raised. And, and you're taking that water that you, we treat as a waste and you're putting it into uh, a depression um, like this rain garden right out there and allowing the water to infiltrate into the ground. So there's one in front of my house in Ann Arbor in the, midst of, in the middle of my buffalo grass lawn. Uh, that rain garden's there. This was the first rain garden in Washtenaw County taking water off the street. The city thought it was such a great idea they even came and drilled the hole in the curb for me to take the water off the street. And there's one that's a second year rain garden in a client's backyard and a second year rain garden um, commercial one that we built and that's a rain garden in my front yard. And there's another vantage point um, off the roof, downspout, and just flowed into that bed. And that's my maize and blue rain garden. Um, look at the date on that picture, late, late, late August. So I'm sequencing my plants across the growing season. You could see the seed, the, the seed pods there of the swamp milkweed, which is, um, um, has, has been done for a while. And then, of course, we could do it formally as well um, through large drifts and masses. There's, um, there's probably 50 um, um, wild geranium there and columbine there. And this is big leaf aster, which is not going to bloom for another month and a half or so. There's another picture of that. It's in my backyard with hairy beard tongue in the sun and columbine back there in the shade. Um, there's another formal native perennial bed. Front of my house with black-eyed Susan and purple prairie clover. In the back with mountain mint and coreopsis. You can start to see some echinacea there. And the next picture is going to start over here. And there's the side of my house with echinacea and wild bergamot and rosin wheat. There's still some remnant daylilies left. I keep telling my wife, gee, they look kind of sick. I don't know how long they're going to live. And she says, don't you dare. <laughs> um, I don't think so. I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know why. I mean, if they hit that plastic pipe, I think they're just going to go around it. Um, yeah. Um, and then you've seen the back there. But this is very formal. Um, and you've seen that picture. Um, and of course, you could do informal plantings, too. So we had a client who um, was um, had a large property and they were kind of impatient to wait for a seeding, so we planted 12,000 plugs for them. Um, and this is just second year, planted them randomly and haphazardly. That's, um, so we planted in 2014, that's a 2015 picture, that's a 2016 picture. So how can you start? You could be like Drew and rip everything out and start all over again. But um, 
Um, it, it, it's costly and it's time consuming, um, but you know, I mean, this is my profession. I do a lot of my R&D at home. And at least until the IRS tells me otherwise, any money I spend on my home landscaping is tax deductible. Um, but you could, you could take out a little lawn every year and make a perennial bed or a rain garden, or you could flip a perennial bed. Or at the other end of the spectrum, just whenever a plant dies, replace it with a native plant. And if you do that, you'll be moving forward. So here are all the wildlife pictures from either my 14 hundredths of an acre in Ann Arbor or my quarter acre in Novi. Quarter acre is not all that large either. There's swamp milkweed and the inevitable aphid attack in August. This is the time to stop and practice your meditative breathing and wait for the lady beetles to show up. And even if the lady beetles can't keep up with them and the aphids suck all the juice out of it and top kill it, it's not going to kill the plant. It will be back next year. Because um, if you sprayed that, you're going to kill the lady beetles and, and all the other things that will eat aphids as well. You'll kill the good guys too. Um, a bee on mountain mint and wild bergamot and swamp milkweed and echinacea. Here's a video of bottle gentian. Um, it's a closed flower that only our native bumblebees are strong enough to open. Now this is going, uh, I wasn't like a wildlife photographer sitting there for hours waiting for this. This is going on every sunny September afternoon. Gulp. So how cool is that? I got that going on all September. What flower is that? Bottle gentian. Gentiana and drusii. Um, requires pretty consistent moisture. Um, there is New England aster in October. And look at all the bees on that. Now here's my short rant on bees. Forget about everything you hear about the, the honeybees. Honeybees are only a concern not for conservation reasons, but for economic reasons, because we can always make more of them. It's the native bees that are in trouble because we can't make more of them. I mean, just look at all the bees there. Now, while I'm there, this is going on all afternoon. Now, if there were a weed in there, I'd have no hesitancy to reach in there, arm, shoulder, neck, and head, because they're at the candy store and they are not interested in me. And then that guy shows up. I think that's a sulfur, yellow sulfur. And then I have dragonflies. I have golden alexanders, which is the host plant for the black swallowtail caterpillar. So I'm raising black swallowtails. I'm raising monarchs and other butterflies as well. Because I have a pond, in my backyard, the um, male toads in April come by and they serenade their women. And when they do that, you get toad porn. <laughs> and then, of course, you get babies. And the green frogs showed up as well. Just showed up. And they reproduce as well. And then when cardinal flower is in bloom, the ruby-throated hummingbird is there. Now, I have a number of species of, of plants and flowers across the growing season that are, have long tubular flowers. And so I have hummingbirds all season long. So I don't need to go buy a hummingbird feeder. This is my hummingbird feeder. I could sit there and just watch the hummingbird all afternoon. Um, morning dove coming for a drink. Even had a great blue heron show up. Now, you may not be able to see it in the columbine seeds there, but there is a goldfinch, and there is a, there is a goldfinch, and there is a goldfinch, and there's one over there. There's a closer of it all afternoon in the middle of June. Goldfinch on my rosin weed. Um, I do provide housing. Robin. Even have ducks show up. Um, there is a robin taking berries from red twig dogwood on the 4th of July last year. 
One day I'm sitting in my office and I hear a splash. And I look out and I see this bird fly out from underneath the water in my pond. This is a female belted kingfisher <clears throat> with one of my goldfish. So one, I'm sitting there when this happens, which makes me wonder how often is it happening. Two, the camera's right next to me. Three, the batteries aren't dead. And four, it sat there and posed for me. Now it's a little blurry because I took the picture very quickly through a window screen. But a bad picture is better than no picture. And there's my winter bird feeder. You could see the seeds on the snow and see all those juncos. I'll wake up in the morning and there are a hundred of these guys out there. I don't need to go run to Wild Birds Unlimited, um, spew carbon dioxide out my tailpipe to go get seed for, for a bird feeder. I got one right there. Um, an opossum showed up. Now these are great little animals. They are tick magnets. And so as they walk around, the ticks just jump out of the vegetation and latch onto them. So in that regard, they're beneficial to human health. Two, they're the only, they are, they're the only North American marsupial, and they're cuter than hell. Now, what eats songbirds? Cooper's hawks. So I regularly have a Cooper's hawk patrolling my yard. And I didn't show you a picture of this, but I have brush piles. And who knows what's living inside them. But because of that, I got coyotes nearby. And I regularly wake up in the morning and see coyote poop in my yard. Mm -hmm. So I try to live by this ethic that when I borrow something from somebody, I return it to them in better condition than when I found it. So if I borrow a neighbor's tool and it needs a little oiling, I'll, I'll oil it before I return it to my neighbor. And there's this North American or Native American proverb that essentially says, the land's not ours. The land belongs to our children and we only borrow it from them. So, if, so me trying to live by that ethic of returning something that I borrowed in, in better condition than when I found it, um, I, can do, I do that professionally and I do that home um, through the simple act of landscaping with native plants. And it's something that each and every one of us could do very, very simply. So, questions, thoughts, comments, emotional outbursts? <laughs> yeah? It works. We slowly, over time at home, we've changed over to native plants and stuff. I listened to Drew a year ago at White Lake and showed that video with all the butterflies and the bees over the garden. I, I thought, oh man, that would be great if you could do that and everything. And one night last year, late summer, I had that very thing. It was awesome. I got my camera out. I was taking pictures. It really worked. It, it's great. You can just sit there, eat dinner outside in the evening, and, and just see all of this going around. It's like going out into the woods or sitting next to a prairie. There, there's so much going on, yeah, we, absolutely. We could get bluebirds, all kinds of different birds in and everything in that regard. And I'm the property manager here at the Civic Center. And if you're looking for a way not to water all the time and everything, again, this is the way to go and everything. Uh, we've slowly transferred over over the years and everything and hardly any water And, and even, you know, pe and people will say, well, I'm on a well. Well, it still takes electricity to run your well. And, and we're burning up the planet fast enough as it is without using more electricity. I mean, if you've got solar up on top, then okay. I'll, I'll give you a break on it then. Other questions? Yes?
and my parents keep wanting me to get her involved. And I'm like, I love to see the bees and the flowers that they love and you know, the birds coming in. And I, it's like I'm tempted to go to the council and say, you know, why mow? Why have all of these pesticides coming in? It's, it's really unhealthy for people as well. Yeah, so municipal, so one, um, a lot of those don't necessarily apply to a maintained bed, for example. Two, there are municipalities that are adopting new ordinances. So Ferndale has a new ordinance so within the last few years that if you um, are using native plantings and you register it with the city um, and you abide by certain things like within certain feet from a, a corner, um, you could grow a tall grass prairie in your front yard. Um, Ann Arbor's generally ignored that forever, and you, people have been putting tall grass prairies in their front yards for 20 years. Even Novi now has a new landscape ordinance that, that basically says, if it is a planned landscape, you could do whatever you want. So I could put a tall grass prairie in my front yard, and one of the ways I'd make it look planned is I'd just take some rocks and put it around it and it'd be planned. Now sometimes you have to think like a lawyer. So remember I showed you those short prairie grasses in my lawn extension and also in that client's lawn extension? Well for that client he got some complaints about his grass being too tall. So sometimes you have to think like a lawyer. So Ann Arbor Ordinance says you can't let your turf grass grow more than eight inches. So the ordinance officer came over and the client explained to him that this is not turf grass. The ordinance specifically refers to turf grass. And the ordinance officer said, you're right, have a nice day. End of discussion. So um, we're, we're starting to move forward. I mean, I find it really interesting that a place like Wolverine Lake, where people are trying to move away from the city to get it in nature, that they're using ordinances to um, it, 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 you know, to make it look like you're living in the, in the darn city again. So um, it, it, does take, it does take citizen activism sometimes. Um, it took me two years to get um, Novi to adopt a prescribed burning ordinance, um, working with the fire chief and city council and the city manager. Um, but after two years, and, 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 and as a result of that, Novi um, had a contractor yesterday burn 51 acres of Phragmites. So they went from, went from the fire chief saying to me originally, oh, you're on a small quarter acre lot. You might burn your neighbor's house down to them burning 51 acres in one afternoon. Other thoughts or questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, we were, it's not very good, but we use all these chemicals to build the area around it so we can see mm -hmm. the plants. I guess I would say, is there any reference to books or, or anything that you would recommend or websites to go to? Like, I, I would like to have something low around it that, you know, we don't have to worry about putting chemicals, but we can yep. still see the birds. So we Go to the Natural Shoreline Partnership okay. in Michigan. What, what's the name of that it's, group? It's pretty much exactly Is right. The, yeah, the Natural Shoreline Partnership. Um, my website has some resources. Uh, there's a resources page that, that you could read there. You could, you could take out um, all the vegetation in the part that you see and replant it with short natives. Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there are plenty of plant lists out there. My website has one. Native plant producers all have, have websites that talk about, um, you, you know, the name of the plant, the soil conditions it likes, the light conditions, the height of it. And you can, you know, next to a pond, you'd be looking for wetland species that, that would be short and probably full sun. Yeah.
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been, I've been working on a, a retention basin in my neighborhood. I've been going in and I've been killing the cattails and the Phragmites in there. And I've been taking the seeds from my rain gardens and oh, I've also been killing the reed canary grass around it. Then I've been taking the seeds from my rain gardens and scattering it in there. And I'm starting to have an impact. So I'd look for a wetland. I'd love for you to come, but I'm sure I could never afford to be here. Oh, I don't know. You can, you can talk to me later. So this far south in the state, um, most of the cattails, and I can't remember which which one's the native, whether it's narrow leaf or broadleaf. Okay, so broadleaf cattail is the native cattail. Um, but if you see a monoculture of cattails, it is not the native cattail. And you really only find the, the native cattail up, up north. Here you find the invasive, non native, and a hybrid between the two. So if you see a monoculture, you can just generally assume it's not the native cattail. So when I see that, um, and, and I'm working on the site, out it goes. Well, thank you for coming.